Good morning and welcome to MRO Digest. As part of our series of monologues on topics of interest to the forum here, today I will be speaking to you on the renewable energy disruption which is likely to take place over the next decade, decade and a half. On the screen, you could see uh, the various forms of uh, renewable energy. Basically, a renewable energy is one which is perpetually renewable. So you have wind, you have the sun, you have tidal, you have geothermal, you have sea waves. And in the background, I have shown a picture of how the conventional power sources are, which generate a lot of pollution, smoke, and are generally nowadays, in the view of climate change, not in focus. So if you look at this green energy, clean energy future for India, Today, India has about 500 gigawatts of installed power capacity of all types. Out of this, renewable power is at 170 gigawatts. All in the period uh, last 28 years, 15, 1994 and 2022. Now, our India's annual uh, requirement increase on this is about 50 gigawatts every year we need. And our government has set a target and committed in all world forums that we will have 450 gigawatts of renewable by 2030. So that is another 280 gigawatts in the next seven years. And in the next seven years, we need about 350. So almost 80, 90 percent of all fresh additions to our power installation will be renewable in the form of solar, wind, small hydro and hydrogen. So the government has set this very ambitious target of 450 gigawatts by 2030, out of which 140 gigawatts would come from wind energy and rest will be a mixture of solar, hydro, etc. The 140 gigawatts of wind will have 30 gigawatts of offshore wind and 110 gigawatts of onshore wind. Just a short uh, word on offshore wind. It's very popular in Europe, etc. The cost of a project installation is almost double that of onshore, but much larger turbines can be used. On land now in India, we have up to 3 megawatts. But the moment you go offshore, you can go 6 and even 10 megawatt turbines. There are no problem with land acquisition in a place like India where land is in short supply. Land acquisition politics is a lot for onshore turbines. But when you go offshore, this issue is resolved. And due to better winds and smoother winds and planar winds with lesser turbulence, you get much better generations offshore than onshore, almost 30% more for the same. Now coming to solar power. In India, solar power has grown to about 62 gigawatts to be precise as on today. And the government wants to add another 300 gigawatts by 2030. And the beauty of it is solar power costs have fallen from 15 rupees per kilowatt hour when I left the organization army and joined the renewable energy sector that is 10 years back and now it is only rupees 2.2 per unit. Similarly, wind prices have halved over the last 10 years. But there are certain problem areas still. One is wind is unpredictable on a day to day basis. It may blow, it may not blow, it may blow very fast, it may blow slowly and that affects the power coming out. The sun, as we all know, does not shine at night. So the power coming from renewable sources is always fluctuating. Next is grid peak times mismatch. At peak requirement, that is early morning and evenings, you might find that renewable power runs short. And at sometimes renewable power is in excess. And when it is in excess, the grid requirement is low. Cost is no longer an issue. As I said, today, wind is available at 2 rupees 70 paisa unit, solar at 2 rupees 20, 2 rupees 30 paisa unit. It was an issue till about four years back, but due to improvement in technology, cost of renewable power is no longer an issue. So we should understand first as to how is a grid managed. The grid is like a tube. Every unit of power that you produce has to be consumed simultaneously. If consumption is more, the grid voltage will fall and the grid will trip. If consumption is less, grid voltage will rise and the grid will again trip. So it has to be exact. So you have a concept called smart grid management. So in this slide, I have shown the various sources of uh, 
power you have wind you have solar you have hydro you have geothermal you have nuclear all these come to the state load dispatch center where they are continuously managing consumption versus production and it, it requires a lot of software it's a very complex uh, uh, aspect and in fact in most of the engineering colleges uh, when you study power management smart grid management involves uh, is a major topic of research Coming to the cost aspects, in this slide, I've shown how the cost of renewable power has been coming down compared to conventional electricity rates. And now, 2016, 17, 18, we are in grid parity. The cost of renewable power is equal to normal power, what you get from coal, gas, et cetera. And it is still falling. And uh, actually now by 2022, 2023, it has come below the cost of conventional power. So now it makes sense for industry, for people to switch to renewable power, which is why the government is going so aggressively with renewable power as well. So there is going to be a disruption ahead when we are going to switch entirely to renewable and conventional resources will get stuck. Now, just to show how technology disrupts, I've taken a slide from one of my uh, uh, very favorite authors, Tony Siba where he's shown how technology disrupts. In this picture, you have a photograph of Fifth Avenue, New York City in the year 1900. It is full of uh, horse-drawn carriages. There is one small car which I have encircled, which has come up. And that had just come. In fact, it hardly looks like a car. And the same photograph captured uh, about 13, 14 years later, there is no, no horse-drawn chariot. In fact, where I have circled, there's a small horse-drawn chariot there. Otherwise, we have switched to a new technology that is the IC engine, the cars which came in. So that is how technology disrupts. And when it disrupts, initially it starts slowly and then rapidly, rapidly kills the other technologies in the market. Now, if you look, uh, the key disruption technologies which have come up, and are all maturing roughly simultaneously. Today we have sensors, the Internet of Things. Almost all of us are aware of the various sensors available. In fact, we wear a lot of sensors on our body, uh, sensors which communicate with the net. I had given an example some time back of sensors available in our wind turbines. So the uh, sensor costs have come down a lot and sensors which can communicate on the Internet where they were used to cost a few hundred dollars today you get sensors uh, as low as 20 rupees that is 20 cents or so next is artificial intelligence and machine learning this is a field in which there has been great progress thanks to the speed of the internet the uh, computing power etc we find that a lot of heuristics have come up which make artificial artificial intelligence very practical in production in data analytics etc and this enables in the manufacturing sector and other sectors robotics to come up the next disruption technology is solar photovoltaic cells i will cover this in detail later but i'll just give you an example in the last 15 years the cost of a solar photovoltaic panel has fallen by as much as 95 percent due to technology then we come to energy storage, which I will cover in greater detail. Another disruptive technology is 3D printing, additive manufacture, which enables very fine manufacture to take place, as well as large scale manufacture. We have examples recently in India where even a small house has been printed through 3D. We have rocket engines being manufactured through 3D. And this is creating a huge disruption in the manufacturing sector because suddenly, you do not need such large machines. You do not need so much manpower. Uh, a lot of automation takes place here. Then the internet and the cloud and the mobiles, data analytics, nanotechnology, where we are talking of very fine 10 to power minus 9 uh, meters size of technology, which are there in various aspects, ranging from the medical field to wearable technology to nanoware, etc which is a separate topic by itself. 
and the last is lidar which will i will also uh, speak of because it forms a close part of this presentation now coming to computing power we are all aware of moore's law moore's law says that computing power doubles every 2 years and computing storage and size of com storage computer storage halves every 2 years and if we see over the last 40 years this has proved to be true today's computers are almost a million times faster than what was there 40 years ago similarly computer storage in 1988 when i started um, my journey into the field of computers a 64 kb ram used to be as big as a small uh, you know godrej cupboard in 2000 uh, in 1993 when i uh, came to teach computer science in mao we found that a 4 gb ram was like a small desk today on your mobiles you have even 128 uh, gb rams which are as big as your fingernail so that is how computing power has increased and computing storage has in fact the, the power of your normal smartphones of today say a 10000 rupees smartphone today would have costed something like 100 million in 1975 and a uh, uh, the amount of computing power a smartphone has today to have a computer like that in 1975 it would have been a large room if you look at uh, now how just as an example of how computing power has increased in the year 2000 the world's first teraflop trillion floating point operations per second computer came out by sandia national labs it occupied something like a small 2 bhk 1600 square feet space it consumed 850 kilowatts of power which is massive almost what large turbines produce wind turbines and it costed about 45 million dollars today what you see here is a 2.3 teraflop supercomputer its power consumption is just 15 watts like a small bulb and it cost 60 dollars so million times cheaper much more powerful consuming less power and these are what are being used now to make robo taxis etc and recently uh, nvidia has come out with a 8 teraflop supercomputer so if you look at when new technology comes in like i showed you in that photographic thing of how the car came in this blue line depicts a new technology coming and uh, the red line depicts the fall in price so when a new technology comes in it comes in slowly but when that technology is, uh, reaches maturation maturity it comes uh, grows very fast and it destroys the existing technology in the industry and then it itself flattens out until another newer technology comes we have examples of uh, the horse carriage which i showed you you know how black and white tvs lasted from 1960s to about 1980s and then the color tv came in the color tv lasted till 2005 then the lcd tv came in the lcd tv has gone we all know the famous story of the kodak film nobody uses uh, camera film none of us uh, many of us the younger people may not know where, what a letter box is similarly we are seeing the end of landline telephone so let us see now where all our disruption coming in due to renewable the first is in solar as i brought out the cost of solar panels has come down and wind has also come down and in early 1996 that is just 30 year, 25 years back the total capacity of wind and solar in the world was 200 megawatts today every day the world is installing more capacity than that so that is the rate at which it is growing if we look at the rate of growth in renewable energy is growing at about 41% cagr per year that is doubling every 2 years and if that happens 100% of all energy not just electricity in the world will switch to renewable by 2040 and 2040 is not very far away uh electric uh, consumption if it keeps doubling every two uh, two years by 2030 you might find 100% of electricity uh, renewable in solar there is something called a swanson effect like we spoke of moore's law swanson effect says that basically the cost of a solar panel halves every time the amount of installation in the world doubles 
So basically, the cost is of a solar panel is also coming down by about 50% every two years. And where it used to cost uh, for a per watt something like $75 in uh, 1977, today it is as low as 10 cents. So it's that cheap. But we still have a problem. The sun shines only in the day. What do we do by night? And this is the second disruption area. That is energy storage. I've shown you here a photograph of the Tesla in the solar city, you know, the storage, how they have in the houses, very neat batteries inside the house. And it is in this area which is going to dramatically make renewable energy usable. We see that battery prices are also tumbling. Something like 19% annually battery costs are coming down. In 2010, the cost per kilowatt hour of a battery was about $1,000. Today, it is $100 and still falling. And a combination of renewable energy with storage suddenly becomes usable, where you don't need normal supply. Renewable, whenever it's extra, the batteries store up. Whenever it's less, you draw power from the batteries. And in this battery sector, it is lithium-ion battery technology, which has driven the initial change. The costs are halving every five years. And uh, the fee industries which are investing trillions of dollars in lithium ion battery technology are IT, electronics, are mobiles, automotive, and the energy sector. But as you know, lithium is a rare metal and it is found in a very few countries. So there's a lot of research going on to alternatives, which is a separate topic by itself. New battery technologies coming up, like hydrogen fuel batteries, lithium sulfur batteries. Graphene supercapacitors. In fact, we have supercapacitors already in the wind energy as battery batteries for the pitch batteries, reduced oxidation flow batteries, aluminum graphite batteries, bioelectric batteries, thin film batteries, solid state. So, in our uh, series of monologues, we will cover the various battery technologies sometime later. So, if we look now at a house which has got rooftop solar plus storage you will see that the cost is going to come by 2040 the costs are going to fall to a level whereby it becomes cheaper than transmitting so man will get independent from the grid today the cost of uh, hybrid renewable power in india is about five crores per megawatt cost of storage is about four crores per megawatt so the cost per unit, per kilowatt hour, is coming to about 6 rupees a unit with storage. But this cost is halving every five years. And the moment it comes down to 2 rupees a unit, it becomes cheaper than transmission costs of current power. And by 2040, even transmission costs, it becomes cheaper than even transmission costs. So then you will find that a lot of industry will die. Centralized generation, power utilities, nuclear plants, natural glass plants, coal plants, all these will not be able to compete with renewable power. And you'll find a lot of these industries will collapse. People say, what about the resource angle, etc.? As I said, one is a lot of alternative battery technologies coming up. And uh, you know the entire requirement of battery packs is less than 1% of the known reserves of lithium, nickel, manganese, copper. And over a period, this new battery chemistries will shift to other source materials, making packs lighter, smaller, cheaper, less polluting, and they'll become more popular. The next factor which is going to disrupt our power sector is the electric vehicle. About three years back, the best car in the world, as per the automotive journals in the world, was the Tesla, declared as the best car in the world. Not the best. Electric car, but the best car itself. It was given a rating of the good cars, the Mercedes, the Lamborghinis, etc., get ratings around 60, 70. The Tesla was rated at 105 on various parameters, more than 100. India, as a part of its uh, national mobile, mobility uh, and electrification plan, says by 2040, we will switch to electric vehicles only. All manufacture in India from 2040 onwards will be only electric vehicles. China has already said that by 2030, they will achieve 40% replacement of all their vehicles with electric vehicles. Now, what are the advantages of an electric vehicle? 
The first is its energy efficiency. An IC engine has an energy efficiency of about 17 to 20 percent, whereas an electric motor is 90 to 95 percent. It's almost 100 percent. Second is, if you look at a normal IC engine, it has about 2,000 moving parts. But an electric vehicle has just 18 moving parts. The days of transmission, drive shaft, clutch, wall, differentials, pistons, gear, carburetors, crankshafts will all go. So it becomes almost uh, an electric vehicle is much cheaper to maintain and has much more warranty. In fact, like Tesla gives an infinite mile warranty for eight years on their cars. But when you are drawing so much power, when so much of the vehicles become electric, you're going to create huge disruptions on the grid. The grid, uh, as we know today, until it is massively upgraded, needs to handle much more power, much more storage. And how does one do it? So one of the technologies which is coming up, and there are major experiments going on in Germany, in Australia, even in the US, of something called vehicle to grid and grid to vehicle. So I will just cover this in slightly greater detail over the next few slides. Basically, in this, we know an electric vehicle has typically between 30 to 150 kilowatt batteries. It can power a house or even a small apartment building for a day or two, one electric battery of a car. So if you have a two-way charging system on a car, which is hooked onto a house or in your apartments, you can use it to stabilize power supply to the house. When there is a shortage of power, you can draw from the cars. Similarly, we can do such a thing on the grid. If we know, if we realize that our cars are running for not more than 4 to 5 percent time in a day, one hour, two hours maximum. 80 to 90 percent of the time, the cars are not running. And that is the time when if they are all these cars have smart two-way charging systems, the electric cars, and they are hooked onto the grid, they act as a distributed power storage. And that's a massive resource available to the grid to keep itself stabilized. So electric vehicles become basically like power plants on wheels. And uh, as the world switches to electric vehicles, we're talking of 40% uh, of all vehicles by, say, 2030, 2040, switching over to electric. So, so let us say in a small town, you have 10,000 electric vehicles, which is less than 40% of the vehicles in a town. Suddenly, you are having something like, uh, and each has a power battery of 50 kilowatts. Suddenly, you're having 500 megawatts, half a gigawatt of storage available which otherwise would have become very costly to buy and put in a plant. But because of these vehicles, you have distributed storage. The ownership of the storage is with the people. And whenever they are not running, they are hooked onto the grid. When the grid requires power, it will draw from the batteries. And the grid is surplus on power, it charges the batteries. So why is this vehicle to grid? So, uh, you know, it is really sensational and uh, it's going to happen because the aim is to fully integrate electric vehicles into a power grid. So we will charge the grid when the cost of power is low and discharge from the EV to the grid when the cost of power is high. That is when the demand is high. So that demand supply gap on the grid will be handled by the storage available in the electric vehicle. Smart charging solutions are already available. Like you have the Nissan Leaf, etc. They already have these smart charging solutions. It enables the electric vehicle owner to communicate with the power grid, monitor the frequency of the grid, and manage the flow and cost of electricity to his car. So a vehicle to grid technology provides a lot of service to the grid. It enhances the efficiency of the grid in peak load time, and it increases the stability of the grid. It also, as I brought out earlier, the sun might be uh, does not shine at night. The wind blows, does not blow. But because of so much storage, which is always 80% of the vehicles are hooked onto the grid, it improves the grid's capability to handle renewable power and makes renewable power sources even more easily integratable and affordable. So the EVs act as distributed storage, providing energy back to the grid and drawing from the grid as well. 
and as a part of uh, the incentive whenever you sell to the grid that you will be paid for it so integrating electric vehicles with power systems benefit both the owner of the vehicles as well as the owner of the power system the grid what i brought out just now it enables charging of the vehicle from the grid when demand on the grid is less that is cost of power is less and it discharges from the vehicle to grid when there is more demand that is the cost of power is more it enables a stabilization of the grid millions of evs across a nation will act as a distributed grid storage and stabilize the grid and it will also reduce the cost of ownership of the electric vehicles as you earn when selling to grid at higher costs so v2g uh, basically turns electric vehicles into distributed energy resources and changes the entire dynamics of grid management of using these vehicles where your vehicle is not just a consumer of electricity but it's a power provider also but the success of v2g and g2v depends on how many vehicles so it will not happen immediately experiments are taking place in smaller uh, you know just in buildings or small apartments but as the fleet increases to say 10 percent of a nation or above then you can it will act as a usable source there has to be also consumer acceptance now you can adjust the vehicle that my vehicle will not discharge say more than 30 percent so that there's no emergency available and there are certain technical constraints and myths in uh, people's minds even in the mro forum i could see people are saying battery life will fall no battery life will not fall because this hook on to the grid will enable trickle charging. You don't need uh, the rapid charging. So it will be a very slow trickle charge where you're monitoring the frequency. When it goes to, say, 49 uh, hertz, you start drawing from the battery. When it goes to 50 point something, you start charging the battery. So it's a very fine trickle uh, bidirectional flow of charge. And it does not affect battery life. So load share shaving of a load uh, load sharing sorry that should be ancillary services it provides vehicle to grid of better managing the frequency of the grid you have much more stable grids small power transactions will take place the power factor you will be able to really manage reactive power losses very well as you're aware we have active power and reactive power in a grid the moment you have large storage you can control the reactive power losses and you'll have large energy communities coming up, which will be connected to energy management systems, complementing normal storage, which will provide additional free storage of renewable energy and increase your autonomy from other sources of power. So, as I brought out the advantages of the electric vehicle, uh, V2G, G2V solution, uh, which is going to... Uh, come up makes electric vehicle uh, integratability much easier and renewable energy uh, integration much easier so we will see that the death of the ic engine is inevitable 2040 is when you would find that almost across the world production of the ic engine will stop we are going to switch to electric vehicles and this is one more disruption which will come because of renewable energy and storage the next disruption which is going to affect the power sector as well as uh, the transportation sector is the autonomous vehicle disruption. So here I've shown a small uh, autonomous self-driven car, a Google car. On top of it, you see the a LiDAR. A LiDAR is something like a radar, but it uh, throws out millions of laser pulses every second. And uh, the reflected laser pulse is what it interprets. So when a vehicle is moving, it is basically throwing uh, millions of uh, laser pulses every second and capturing the reflected image, which goes on to an onboard computer. So it will find out where are the stationary objects, which are the cars coming from the opposite side, where uh, if a person is going from left to right, what is the speed of the person? And this data goes into the car and it is shared. It goes and gets converted into driving instructions. Now. This car is not in isolation. They're, all these cars are hooked onto the net. And they are sharing information with each other. So your car will get to know what is the traffic, say, 100 yards ahead, 10 kilometers ahead. 
your car will know, uh, get to know information of what is immediately in front of you as well. Today, when you use uh, Google Maps and go for a drive, you already know very accurately where there is heavy traffic. It's because so many of these cars are hooked onto Google Maps. So when an autonomous car comes in, you get a clear picture of what is happening. The information is being shared between thousands of cars, and there's a massive amount of computing ability. Now, if you see LiDAR, in the early days, people were very doubtful because LiDARs were very costly. In 2012, a LiDAR was almost two, three feet in size and costing $150,000. By 2014, it fell to $1,000 and the size kept reducing. And today, it is the size, LiDAR has come down to the size of a postage stamp, less than $100. Hence, you can have many LiDARs on a car and that improves the quality of the data you're getting. So basically, an autonomous vehicle is going to become a computer on wheels. And as computing power, AI, machine learning improves, you'll find that these cars are, will be much safer than human-driven cars. Because a human, due to fatigue, due to various reasons, is capable of making mistakes. But this is powerful computers getting fantastic amount of data, AI, machine learning will not make the same errors. Already in small enclosed places, uh, an autonomous vehicle is much safer than a human driven vehicle. So we are going to see due to renewable energy, these technologies which are coming in, solar, storage, electric vehicles, self-driving cars, which are going to disrupt the energy sector by destroying conventional sources of energy, by ending those industries and the current transportation which are dependent on fuels carbon fuels by switching to electric vehicles and self-driving vehicles so if we look back to the future now today and how it goes in, this is the disruption is which is going to happen that is renewable energy is going to massively impact the transport sector i've given one example you already see uh, examples of uber ola where people now no longer want to own a car they prefer to do these ride-sharing apps. If you see our car, as I bought out earlier, not more than an hour a day you use it. It is your second largest capital expense after your house. An average car costs about something like uh, 8 lakhs. And if it is parked for uh, 23 out of 24 hours, that means 96% of the time it is not running. It is very poor asset utilization. And Poor asset utilization becomes industries which are ready for disruption. So ownership of cars is going to reduce. We are going to find more shared ownership of cars so that the asset utilization improves. And suddenly you'll find, in fact, the number of cars on the roads will start reducing the moment personal ownership goes out. And the moment you get into uh, self-driven cars, autonomous cars, you'll find that that ego satisfaction which you get by buying a giant car will go down as well. So EVs have better energy efficiencies, your asset utilization autonomous is going to disrupt the field of transportation. And what is all driving all this disruption is all those technologies, renewable power and storage. So we are now on the cusp of major disruptions in the field of energy and transportation. 2023, we are here. I've just put back that old photo. And you will see in another 12, 13, maybe maximum 17 years, by 2040, the world is a different world from what? Clean energy is going to dominate it. 90% of your power sources will only be clean energy. The old uh, nuclear uh, plants, your gas plants, coal plants will all shut down. And it's not that they have, they have become extinct. Remember, the horse carriages did not uh, run out because they were uh, the horses got extinct. No, it's a new technology will come and kill old technologies. So you're going to find huge disruptions in the field of energy and transport. So the future is now. The disruption is not in the future. It is now. Thank you. Thanks a lot. It's been great presenting this topic to you all.